Hey, good morning, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Devin Dodson, Assistant Director of the Water and Science Administration. Good morning, everybody on the panel as well. Thanks for uh, staying with us while we reopen the uh, second interview with the office. One of the great things about Wednesdays is that we're all in the office, whether we're all in the office together. And one of the great things about being in the office again is we all get to see each other. So it doesn't surprise me at all that this meeting became overflowing and you have to open up a, a second room. When MDE comes together, we come together and we're all here on Wednesday together to hear this presentation. I thank the team for putting this all together. Um, I'm going to read what has been nicely prepared for me because I'm supposed to. But uh, the reality is, let me uh, go off script and tell you what I used to do when I was upstairs in the office of the secretary. One of the roles that I had was working with our emergency response division of the nuclear emergencies. And so I learned a lot about what the state does to prepare for emergencies and what this agency does. And so then we've created a climate emergency preparedness sub team of the water and science administration from our climate team. Amy is the leader of my team uh, with uh, help from the director's office. The climate team is promoting staff awareness about the various roles of responding to emergency situations by offering a series of training events today. Each year, CPES hosts to build a culture of emergency preparedness and improve networking among staff. This is networking will have many secondary benefits that come from our auto awareness of what we all need to know about not just emergency preparedness, but the very many programs of MD and beyond. So this team is going to offer a large-scale three-hour climate emergency response preparedness training in late October, and then another one-hour climate emergency preparedness and response training with public health, focusing on shellfish in September. These training opportunities will be offered in a hybrid format, format similar to today, but we're obviously going to welcome people to come and join us in person and everything can get together. So with that, I'm going to introduce Charlie Wallace. Charlie is our Division Chief of Dam Safety Inspection and Compliance. He's a native Marylander, graduated from Perry Hall High School. In the Charlie has amassed considerable field experience working on high profile projects, such as the Fort McHenry Tunnel, Key Bridge, and several Baltimore and Harvard developments. His scope of experience ranges from plan review and dam design to municipal FPS permit applications for Amarillo County and Newcastle Delaware. After working for consulting and engineering firms, Charlie joined MDE in 2000 and the Dam Safety Division in 2006. So if we could, I feel a warm welcome to Charlie. Good morning, everyone. Um, we have to see such interest in dam safety. Hopefully, this next hour will be well spent. Before we get started here, I'll also want to say we used to have one division. Now we split into two. We're now dam safety permits, dam safety inspection, and compliance employees. Our workload has greatly increased over the years. So let's dive into the uh, uh, presentation. Why would we start with Bugs Bunny? Bugs Bunny's got some admirable qualities. He's always prepared, usually ahead of the game, no matter what's presented to him, no matter what adversity or adversary he's facing. He's prepared and like one step ahead. So that's good quality, and that's something we'd like to try to do with damn safety. Also, a few years ago, I heard Chuck Jones, who was one of Bugs Bunny's creators, talk, and he mentioned at the beginning of every cartoon segment, Bugs Bunny was always in peaceful surroundings. Things were calm and serene, and then something intruded with this uh, peacefulness, which caused him to have to take action. And before we delve in, I also want to mention that you know, bunnies, pigs, wolves, deer, beavers, deer, cows, and also what added is for eels were harmed in the making of this presentation. Still very funny to good shape. Okay. 
So this is the Gunpowder River, which separates uh, Baltimore and Hartford counties. And it's in its normal natural state. And this is the way rivers tend to like to behave. But then man comes along and will put a dam and that creates all kinds of patterns. That's some more to help I'll explain what kind of peaceful situation and things can change. Now, this is a photograph taken out of the news recently, and I'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation, but it's a rapid dam failure that was occurring in Minnesota last week. And you see the dam goes across the river, and what used to be the emergency spillway is being overrun, and the existing river is even trying to create a meander like rivers normally do. So flowing water has a lot of force and power. We put a dam there to block that water and control it. It has to be a very large, powerful structure itself. This is a schematic of uh, what a dam looks like. And this is this behaving on me. Yeah. Got some of these pictures out of our uh, library of slides. And for some reason, it's stacking up. Um, you have a massive dam across it, and you can see in the upper right there is what we call an auxiliary or emergency spillway, which allows overflows to go around the dam and get into the original screen bed. We don't want a dam to overtop. That would be, especially if it's a earthen and bank, that would be very disastrous. And also, once the water level behind the dam gets to the level we want it, there's still going to be water coming down the waterway. Dam, so they put a spillway pipe structure in dams typically to capture that water that's coming in and safely pass it through the dam and to allow it to out that downstream. This is a nice side section to help you try to picture this. And Again, you can see the spillway pipe barrel goes through the dam, and then there's the part that rises up to convert it as the riser, which captures any water that comes over. When you see the sunny day water surface, that's the typical reservoir level that we would see behind the dam. We also have different forms that we analyze depending upon what the hazard class of the dam is. And particularly, you'll notice the ones that are over top of the water, the FPMF, PMF. We'll talk about that a little, a little more detail later. On. But PMF is related to a problem probable maximum precipitation that the atmosphere can deliver to a given watershed. So if it's a higher significant hazard, you need to take precautions to properly manage those types of flows. And here are some examples. Concrete dams, these are easily recognizable, most people. To easily identify these dams. And also in Baltimore City, there's an earthen embankment. This is the Drillville Lake Reservoir. This picture was taken from the 60s, shortly after I 83 was constructed, partially on the embankment of that reservoir. But uh, these dams can even be in urban sites. In the state of Maryland, there's probably over 20,000 dams, but at dam safety meeting, Manage an inventory of approximately 600 dams. Several have been reached, but we still keep them listed on the dams place on the dam inventory place order. But you can see these dams spread, spread throughout the state. We have roughly 107 high hazard dams, 130 significant, a little over 300 low hazard dams. And now, what, what do we do at dam safety? What's our principal activity? In our Vision statement will be that we want to maintain functional integrity of these inventory dams. And at the same time, we need to be prepared to address any emergency the dam may experience. And how do we do that? Well, we inspect the dams, go to the existing dams and those that are under construction. We want to see if there's anything obvious that we can catch and address it in a while correct. And we also do some calls not only for new dams, but also for the we also use computer modeling to review breach analysis. We tend to want to see uh, what would happen if the dam was to fail, who would be inundated downstream, and based on what we find from that, we can give 
the dam hazard classification. Now for high and significant hazard dams, the state also requires emergency action plans to be submitted. So we review these emergency action plans and then we try to practice these plans by conducting tabletop exercises. And then finally, we manage emergencies when they occur. Like these three. Okay, at the state, we um, break the hazard classifications into three categories. A high hazard dam, would be if that was the fail, most likely somebody would die or there would be massive infrastructure damage. On the other side, we have low hazard dams where if it was the fail, it's very unlikely that somebody would die or there would be any kind of infrastructure damage. And then in the middle, we have significant hazards, which is kind of between the two. And it's possible that somebody might die or there may be some infrastructure damage, but it should be limited. Now, a lot of what we've learned over the years are from dam failures, and this is an artist's rendition of the Johnstown Dam Failure in 1889. This is probably one of the uh, most famous dam failures, and it's happened just a little over 100 years ago. And there's been a few other dam failures throughout the years in the United States and also around the world. And we try to pay attention and uh, learn our lessons from these uh, dam failures. And even though this is a little bit of a lighthearted presentation, we take our job very seriously as we know other divisions in, uh, in MDE do as well because we're all looking out for the public's interest and it is possible that people will die. And we, from time to time, hear accounts of uh, survivors of dam failures. And we also remember that there are people that have died from dam failures. So we're very cognizant of that in all of our activities. So, in this presentation, we're going to look at what stresses dams and the importance behind that is to have resilience so that if there is a stress on a dam, how can a dam handle that stress and recover from it quickly? And we're going to look at ways to improve resilience. And we're going to show you how the dam safety divisions respond to stresses and we'll walk through an actual emergency event. So resilience, and the first question is, which of these houses will pass a stress test? Here's the stress. The big bad wolf is blowing on the houses. And obviously we want our dams to be like the houses that are made of brick. We want them to be resilient and resist all these stresses that are gonna be encountered. Now here's a picture of a dam that didn't so do so well. This is where the spillway pipe would have gone through. That's where, um, Dams typically will fail and it didn't hold up. Here's another dam where again, the spillway hasn't performed as intended and it doesn't have the resilience that it needs. Now, again, when we have uh, dams that have poor resilience and they don't stand well, resist the uh, stresses, things that occur include like unwanted cost, unwanted attention. It's possible that they're we're gonna have to evacuate people downstream and there can be flooding. And this is a, a high hazard dam out in Garrett County. And you can see you have to have to have to use helicopters to airlift pumps onto the dam embankment so that they can lower the water level. This is a very expensive undertaking. So what stresses dams? We're gonna look at climate change, lack of maintenance, neglect and abandonment, old age, wildlife, block spillways, failing spillway pipes, wind, unusual events. And we'll talk about climate change for a moment. Um, there's a lot of attention being focused on that. And at Dam Safety every year, we're able to go out. FEMA has a training facility in Emmitsburg, Maryland. And about two years ago, the main topic on that was uh, climate change. And so we got to hear from a lot of the experts. And when we talked earlier about the probable maximum precipitation, that has always been envisioned as the most precipitation that can come out of the atmosphere for any given event. And meteorologists prepare tables and they study this and they give us the information. So the state of Maryland, we just concluded having a PMP study done for the state 
because the last time NOAA did a study was like in the 1960s. So we've got current data and information, and this in turn allows for improved design so that if you have to, you don't want to over-design a dam because it's expensive to make a dam bigger and more resilient to storms that it may not experience. You want it, to, but you also don't want it to be undersized so that it can't withstand the stress that it might experience. So this is one thing that we've done in Maryland and we're still processing the information and hopefully it'll be released to the public soon. Lack of maintenance. Now this is gonna be a before and after a set of pictures. This is a dam embankment in Carroll County. This is before with trees overgrown one, you can't even see the dam. And this is what it looks like after the trees were properly removed and a stand of grass was presented there. Not only you don't have the trouble of the trees drawing in water or falling over, but you can see the dam embankment now and look for any problems that might occur. Plus we have a clear and open spillway at the, uh, op at the down outfall end. Neglect and abandonment. This is a dam in Baltimore City where um, you can see that nobody's paid attention to it. The concrete that holds the fence up is just kind of standing up there on their own. There's all kinds of trash and debris. And old age, you can, you can see by the uh, thickness of the trees that they've been there for a long time. And we have deer walking on this embankment and no attention has been paid to it. So it is a, it is a hazard. The beavers. Everybody laughs about beavers, but they are real nuisance to dams this is a dam in harford county and the beavers have blocked the spillway and the lake level is up alarmingly high and if you walk further down that embankment you can see that the water level is actually overtopping the dam in a few locations so this is a problem that needs to be addressed this is a stress this is a picture of the intended opening of the spillway riser to let the water pass through the spillway. It's blocked with beaver debris. After the uh, owner brought some pumps and you can see the pumping line in the bottom of the picture, they lowered the water level low enough that they could get to the blockage so that they could clear it. Oops. And they had to bring some hydraulic uh, machines in to uh, pressure wash and force the debris and the sediment through the rise or spillway so that it could be opened. This is a lot of work. And then here's what it looks like once the spillway was cleared and flow was reestablished. And you can see the lake level has dropped appreciably back to a safe condition. Some, oops. Sometimes we encounter unusual problems. This is actually an embankment spillway that's covered with a cap of concrete, but there were cracks that had appeared over the years in this cap. And during one of the uh, large rain events and the water level rose, the owner was actually reporting that eels were flowing through these cracks. That's something that's kind of hard to believe, but it was a re responsible owner and we took them at the work, so this had to be repaired and this became an emergency. We also get blocked spillways, not just the riser, but sometimes the pipes itself get blocked. And in this case, this is one's in Calvert County and we use the public works. They had some jet rotors that uh, were able to block, to free the blockage. And then you can see on the right-hand side that uh, flow was reestablished. We also sometimes have these small local events, microbursts and flooding. This is the outfall of the dam and of a dam in Baltimore City. You can see in the left-hand picture a real nice implicated block um, outlet was created. And then this was a micro event. And all, in fact, the city was under a tornado warning when this happened and the colors on the radar were like purple. So it was a very intense storm. And on the right hand side, you can see how this um, out, stable outfall was just torn to pieces. We also can have what's known as a piping failure. We have spillway pipe that goes through the dam embankment to uh, let the water flow. 
And sometimes the joints of the pipe get uh, separated, or if the piping material is metal, it can rust and deteriorate. And then instead of the water going through the pipe and into the outlet below, it actually uh, will seep into the dam embankment and start eroding the soil. And that's why this head cut is occurring here. Another reason that we don't like trees on dams are because the soil can get soft at times and then you get very strong winds and the trees will blow over and it will create a very large gaping hole in the dam. If you look closely at this picture, you can see that the uh, hole goes back to about the center of the uh, spill of the uh, dam embankment crest. It, it was a very large hole, and so there's not much soil holding the water back behind the dam. And we also have trouble sometimes with gophers and that making their holes. And there's a number of other challenges that we face with dams. These are all stresses. So where would the general uh, MDE population fit in? It would help us if we could have improved situational awareness. We have over 600 dams on our inventory, and we can't be everywhere all the time. So if you happen to live near a dam or you see something that's unusual, we would certainly appreciate you letting us know about it so we can investigate. And we never, ever want somebody to put themselves in harm's way if they're trying to uh, get some information for us. Also on MDE's um, web page where there's a dam set there's several dam safety web pages and you're certainly invited to browse those to learn more about our operations okay we've talked about the stresses now let's talk about how we can improve resilience to these stresses and things that we do at the state are we prepare emergency action plans we can talk tabletop ex exercises so we can practice using these emergency action plans and it helps us to know lake levels and also approaching weather so that we know how to prepare to respond to what's occurring. And then before an event, we make great efforts to inspect dams and have dam owners maintain their dams and periodically exercise equipment like valves and gates to make sure everything's operating properly when they're needed. Some dams, especially earthen embankment dams, often have embedded instrumentation that we can monitor regularly, and that gives us a baseline of information so that if a dam gets stressed and the uh, water levels change in these uh, monitoring wells, we uh, know how the dam is responding, and we can see when it starts to properly address the uh, stress and returns to normal. And we also encourage dam owners to arrange in advance procurement of construction materials and contractors so that if there is an emergency, they can quickly respond. It's a Chinese proverb that says, dig the well before you are thirsty. So that's what we do. We try to have plans for emergencies before they happen and not have to just react. And we've been talking about emergency action plans or EAPs, and this is the cover page. This is a not super lengthy document, but it's a document that uh, the dam owners are responsible to prepare, and they're supposed to file it with MDE Dam Safety and update it annually. And emergency managers at the local government level also get a copy of this, so that if there's a problem, they're the ones that have to respond for closing roads and evacuating people and the like. So this is a very important document to have. In an emergency action plan, we separate emergencies into three different levels. A level one event, there's no danger that the dam is going to immediately fail but there's something unusual going on. About 12 years ago, we had an earthquake in Maryland. It wasn't a major earthquake, but it was an unusual event. So we put, all, especially all the high hazard dams, we called, declared it a level one emergency. And in a week's time, we went around and visually inspected all the dams or had the dam owners do it just to make sure everything was safe. Sometimes a, a valve or something won't operate. It's a problem that if there was a stress, we would want to we'd be concerned about it, but there's plenty of time to take the steps to repair the situation. Now, a level two event is where things have gotten drastic. The dam is in real distress and it's in danger of failing. 
but there's still an opportunity to take measures to save the dam and not have it fail. At this time also, we alert emergency response personnel that the dam is in a precarious situation so that they can get out their emergency action plan and find out who they may have to evacuate or what roads they may have to close. And then a level three event is where it appears that the dam is going to fail and there's no further action that can be taken to save the dam. And it's important to get people out of harm's way. And a tabletop exercise, we get try to get all the key players in an emergency action plan together in one room. That would be the emergency response agencies, MDE dam safety, dam owners, anybody else that would be an active participant. And we practice a dam. Usually it's a hurricane and we go through all the scenarios and see how people will respond. It's good to see who we may be dealing with in an actual emergency face-to-face -face and understand a little better how the other people are responding to what's going on. Now, we talk about situational awareness, and one of the things we need is information of the lake level and how the dam is performing. And a lot of dam owners have installed this automated information equipment um, that'll read like the lake level and flow through the spillway. And they want to rely on this, but is this, is this the ideal source? And my answer would be no, because usually these manufacturers will say, oh, this will work great 99% of the time. However, that 1% of the time is during a hurricane or some other emergency when we need the information the most, they're not reliable. So we believe that visual information from a human, that's the most reliable source. And we expect dam owners to be monitoring their dams and to actually physically be out there watching the lake level if it's a dire situation. Now, this dam here is in St. Mary's County, and it's a state-owned dam, and it's for flood control plus recreation. And this is the, rock, the top of the riser structure, and you three, see three, uh, these are for the, uh, the uh, gates, that's the operators. The uh, levers will come up as you open and close the gates, and these are going to show up in a couple more pictures. And in this case, there's a staff gauge, which is painted on the side of the uh, ladder. And that's kind of like a roar, but it tells us, it gives us a number as to what the water level elevation is. Now, we value easily, easy to read staff gauges. And in my mind, the most desirable is something like this, where it's green, yellow, and red. Now, this is the same dam where we saw the helicopters lifting the pumps. And on the left-hand picture, you can see the staff gauge and green is showing in the bottom, so the lake level is at a safe level. If the water, water level rises to where it's in the level, then we need to be uh, taking precautions to get ready to evacuate people and see what we can do to keep the water level in check. In this case, if the water level gets high, rather than the dam failing, the auxiliary spillway will start getting flow and it'll start flooding people below stream, downstream. So action needed to be taken and taken quick and you can see in the right hand picture this is from one that we had to uh, put the pumps on there the water level got up almost to the red so we almost had to evacuate people but the pumps were able to water lower the reservoir level just in the nick of time and as you can see in these two pictures a comparison the, the left hand picture is when the lake is at normal level and on the right is when the water levels come up pretty high now, this is the same reservoir behind the dam. And in the left-hand picture, on the very left, you may see two light, little white dots. That's the tops of those uh, gauges that you saw on top of the uh, riser structure. So this is a precarious situation, and you can't really tell what the water level is. So the state, on the right-hand side, they also have a boat launch at a different location than the top of the dam and you can see that there's numbers painted on the curb 69 and 70 so as the lake level comes up somebody a park ranger can read the water level from this curb and know where we're at and what situation we're in so it's important to have a staff gauge where people can actually read them during an emergency it's important to also 
operate gate valves and drains or the drains in the middle of the dam here and the owner arranges to periodically go out and operate the, uh, the gate and to, to lubricate it and maintain it so that it's reliable and in earthen embankments we have monitoring wells usually installed into the dams and it's important to periodically go out and we have devices that we can measure what the water level is in the dam because all earthen dams they do seep water but as long as it's plain water and they're not taking the dam with it it's a safe situation and again we stress to improve resilience that we want to have supplies ready ahead of time to respond to an emergency this is an emergency that happened in 2006 in montgomery county and you can see the stockpiles of material one problem that was you see if you can look in the background there's actually water that's blocking access to get this material where it needs to be and the uh, owner was able to overcome that difficulty now what do we do at the dam safety divisions during an emergency and this is our cubicle farm and you can't really tell on this but there's nobody in the cubicles it's empty because emergencies typically don't happen nine to five monday through friday usually we're at home when these events happen so we have to get to work when there's an event sometimes sinkholes show up in a dam where they're not expected so we got to get the plans out and try to figure out what feature in a dam is at the location where the sinkholes are and try to figure out what's going on again we need situational awareness if you have a hurricane or an earthquake the whole state can be involved and we can't be everywhere simultaneously but usually new stations have their ears to the ground and they know what's going on and they're pretty responsive so one of the things we do is we look at uh the news and we see what they're reporting because that can give us a lot of accurate information quickly we also monitor the weather we need to know what's happened and what is anticipated to happen and this is from the national hurricane center yesterday we have a, a depression that's happening out in the atlantic so we're paying attention to it now and this morning's update shows that even the uh, cone of influence moving further up to like the outer banks in north carolina so we're going to pay attention to this and see if anything comes of it and we have to uh, take other preparation cautions the communication and rumor control is a challenge for us as well during a hurricane a lot of times we're at home in different locations and our homes can lose power so we have to have backup battery power for our phones and computers so that we can talk with each other and that we can talk with the uh, Department of Emergency Management and that we can talk with dam owners because a lot of times dam owners have people who, such as the park ranger that we were talking about earlier, they're not familiar with dams, yet they're the ones that are assigned to watch what's going on. So we talk with them to keep them calm and at ease and to get accurate information from them as to what's going on. And rumor control is important too. During one of these hurricanes, the word got out that the dam was failing when it was actually ready just to have flow go over the spillway which would have still flooded people downstream but the dam itself wasn't failing and cnn got a hold of that and it got back to the governor and we had to go down in person to saint mary's county and verified it indeed the dam was safe even though we had been talking with the uh, park ranger and we knew everything was fine if we know in advance that a hurricane or other uh, stress is coming, we try to send out an email or to all the dam owners, just reminding them to take steps to be prepared for the to, for the event. We also internally prepare a list of dams of concern. This is just to help us focus our attention on dams where we know they're vulnerable and we need to pay extra attention to them it doesn't mean that that's the only dams that could experience an issue but we again certainly want to pay attention to the obvious and then finally mde as well as all the other agencies in the state to send somebody to the joint operations center for mdem during an emergency event like a hurricane and Jeff Donahue's group and MDE emergency response usually will have somebody there. And that way, if, if 
the Joint Operations Center needs information from Dam Safety, they'll reach out to us and we can give them the information. Or if we need help getting information, they can in turn contact other state agencies and maybe have somebody on the scene to tell us what we need to know. This has worked very well in the past. And then finally, not only is it not nine to five, uh, Monday to Friday, most of these events happen at night when you can't see anything. So we stress for dam owners to have lighting available so that they can see their dam, see what's happening, read the staff gauges, anything else. And finally, we're gonna walk through an actual emergency event. This is a dam in Harford County. It's a significant hazard dam and it was created for flood control. And this is a photograph of it from the air right after it was constructed. And you can barely see, but in the center of the dam itself, you can see the riser structure upstream in the lake. And to the right of the dam is the auxiliary spillway. And this is um, what it should normally look like. And it's got plenty of capacity to hold cold water if needed. And here's a photograph closer up view of that riser structure under normal conditions and there's plenty of storage available now on thursday april 24th 2014 me and another dam safety engineer we were doing prearranged inspections in harford county and this wasn't one of the ones on our list but we were going right by it so we decided well let's go take a look at it and lo and behold we were shocked and startled to see the lake level as high as it was. So we were able to reach out to Harford County and they made arrangements to have somebody come out on one of their crews come out on Friday to investigate and see what they could do to uh, resolve the situation. And I wanna point out on this particular emergency event, Harford County was a very responsible dam operator. They had the equipment and personnel and the ability to respond to this and handle it properly. We have a lot of dam owners that aren't so well financed and they have trouble responding to the events the way you're going to see what happens here in 2018 in Carroll County there was a dam that it was a privately owned in an experience an emergency and the dam, dam owner just had no idea of what to do and MDE and the county had to get together to address the emergency and that dam ended up being breached and it's no longer in service so Anyway, Harford County in this case was uh, being responsive and they sent out a crew the next day and they realized that some beaver debris was blocking flow from the riser into the spillway pipe. So they made arrangements to have the, uh, the proper people and equipment come out on the following Monday to uh, clear out the blockage. Now, one of the things when we inspected that, not only was the water level high, but in one of the abutments where the dam meets existing ground had a lot of flow coming out of it where it normally doesn't have any. So this was very alarming. This is a dangerous situation and it clearly got our intent, this attention. This dam is in distress. Unfortunately, on Monday, it started raining and the crews weren't able to safely get into the riser and clear the blockage. And this photograph is taken on two, the, fall, the next day, Tuesday, April 29th, and you can see the water levels come up even higher. So something needs to be done to lower this uh, lake level quickly. And the seepage flow on the downstream end coming out of the abutment is even worse. So Harford County made their phone calls. They arranged to get two very large pumps delivered to the dam with all the associated piping. They had to be brought in uh, probably from a good 100 to 200 miles away to get this type of pumps and dam uh, and uh, piping and the fuel and the like that's needed. As you can see though, this is a rainy event and these delivery trucks can only get this, these pumps and piping so close to the dam, the mud is preventing them from having this equipment delivered where it actually needs to be used. Now, Harford County, again, they've had the resources, so they had tractors and the like, so they brought those. They were able to drag the equipment to the auxiliary spillway where they were placing them. You can see in the distance the riser, how high up the water is coming. Here we're showing the installation of the pipe to uh, 
retrieve the water from the reservoir, and then it'll be discharged downstream. And these are very large pumps, I think they're 12 inch pipes. And then here's the, uh, the pumps in operation now, and you can see it's a large volume of water that's being discharged. They've got some uh, sediment bags on the downstream end that the uh, water is discharging to so that it doesn't erode the uh, soil downstream of the uh, embankment. And you can see just how high the water level had gotten and how large the seepage was. Now, this is two weeks later, roughly May 8th. They had to run these pumps for close to two weeks continuously to drop the water level back down to where it was safe. And now they're starting to dismantle the pumps. And I wanted to discuss at, at, at Dam Safety, the state, we, we have most of our authority to do our work under the environmental article 5-509. And in 2020 or 2021, um, our authority has been increased, especially when we're dealing with emergency actions. And in particular now, um, we're supposed to watch and see if the dam owner is uh, and if they're not taking the appropriate actions to protect the life and property or the environment, that we're assigned the ability to take control of the dam. And then we're supposed to take the actions necessary to render the dam safe. Now, as you can see, this kind of activity to properly address an emergency takes a lot of manpower. It takes a lot of equipment. It takes a lot of resources and knowledge. And in the dam safety divisions, we just don't have that capability at the moment. But uh, MDE and the state are trying to make efforts to get us to a point where we could properly um, deal with one of these dams if a dam owner doesn't have the resources to do that themselves. So this is a challenge that we're facing. Now, getting back to this, the uh, seepage had just decreased. There's not much water. It's just a little bit of water left that's drying up. That, so the uh, seepage had been eliminated once the light level has been drawn down. And you can see how it looks with the riser, with the light level back to where it's supposed to be. And in October that year, we came out and re-inspected it just to make sure everything was fine. And we have, this is on a farm. The, the farm owner made his land available so that the uh, NRCS and the soil conservation districts locally in the county could create this flood control dam. So they still use the, the uh, dam for their farm animals. And we got with the uh, farm owner and asked them to try to not have them on the uh, emergency spillway. And they also would sometimes you can see there's some damage on the dam embankment from the cows walking on it, but this was addressed and rectified. This is a year later in 2015 now. Everything's still fine and normal. 2017, we came out for a reinspection, and lo and behold, the uh, water level's risen again. Again, the beavers have gotten in there and they plugged up the uh, spillway. Fortunately, in this case, it never became an emergency. County crews were able to come out and safely uh, remove the blockage. And when the lake level came up, again, the seepage in the abutment reappeared. And in 2018, you can see that the lake level has been lowered once again back to where it's supposed to be. And the seepage again has dried up. So we have resilience and a return to normal but it's not guaranteed that it's going to be like this tomorrow. So finally, I'd like to express that uh, our group in the two dam safety divisions, and thank you. Yes, can I, should I just leave this up or? Okay. about the beaver dams because i was going to ask um when you dismantle them do you move them somewhere else because it's likely that the beavers are going to come back to the same spot that they had and just make enough so how do you prevent that from happening there's no there's not a good answer to that because if there was we would do it um 
there's some enhancements you can do to riser structures to try to discourage them in cases DNR has removed the beavers, but they do make their way back. So it's an ongoing problem, and that's one of the reasons people have to uh, inspect their dams regularly. Okay. Yep. Yes. Okay. Well, when these emergency spillways, their soil, and if we get a real heavy rain event, the water level will get high, and as it gets high, it tends to move faster. And if the soil is not very stable, if there's it's, if it's not uniformly covered with grass, you can get turbulence in the flow that's going over there, and it'll start tearing up the uh, spillway. If you'll remember in the very first picture where we saw the Rapidan Dam, that was the emergency spillway that was being chewed up. The concrete dam itself kept its integrity. Anybody else in Dan say have anything to add? <laughs> Yes. Um, you mentioned private dam owners sometimes not knowing what to do if an emergency starts to happen. Um, I am not in dam safety, so I have no idea. I'm sorry if this is a very well-known question within your team. I don't answer. Do private dam owners... Or, like, when that happens, on what to do, kind of like, uh, do they have to have emergency training? There's no requirement for them to have the training. They are, if it's a higher significant hazard dam, they do have to have an emergency action plan on file with us, and we regularly. And they're supposed to conduct the tabletop exercise once every five years. That's a new process that we're still integrating into our uh, normal routine, and we're trying to improve outreach with dam owners so that they do become educated we do from time to time conduct workshops where the dam owners can come and learn that a lot of these dams are old they um aren't built to modern standards but they're legally constructed dams but ultimately a dam owner is responsible for their dam and any damage that may happen from it At the, even for well-funded dam owners uh, like a county and that when these situations happen. And now the state is directing us during an emergency to take active uh, control of situations if it's not properly being handled. If they don't properly handle it or an emergency happens and... Like, or whatever, they didn't have the right number of staff on or some, something like that. Um, is there any sort of fine or like, uh, hey, don't do that or anything so they, they don't do it again? Well, the way the law is written now, when we go out and inspect the dam, we give and we see a problem, we write on, we, we tell the owner what the problem is. We give them a written notice and we tell them a certain time frame to make the corrections. Enforcement of that is troublesome. We really don't have penalties per se. It's an area that we're trying to, uh, clean up now and get, get better at as far as enforcing. Matters to the Office of the Attorney General. It can sometimes drag on for a while, but without the dam owner expending funds to repair a situation, we can, if it's a really bad situation, we can require the dam owner to lower their reservoir le level um, and to monitor it regularly. They can usually do, do those two things without much expense, and it keeps us abreast to what's going on. Um, certainly, if the state was to step in and take action, the owner would be responsible for those costs, and it would be applied as a lien to their property if uh, they don't have the money. Budget. Need more in our budget. Well, we used to in the past. In fact, it actually used to be a misdemeanor, a crime, 
if they weren't responsive, but about 15 years ago, that got inadvertently removed from the law. So right now we're. It's still fine. Nope. No. No, not at all? Nope. Like, hey, you don't have a safety action plan at all. Enough of that. Give me a hundred bucks. <laughs> the law does not provide for any similar penalties. And hey, Charles, you have a question uh, from the chat online. Are dam owners for <laughs> there's very few insurance underwriters who would ensure that those policies don't exist? <laughs> So what requirements do they have to fulfill in order to build a dam? Oh, it Alex. come in there. Yeah, well, yeah, new dams. We have, we, we've got a lot more influence. That's what okay. John's group and dam, the, the permits review. Yeah, they got to build it to modern standards and building codes and stuff. Yeah, we have all kinds of, and, and we, we can make sure it's built properly. Do the mm -hmm. old dams have to follow the same building codes? Like, do they have to bring them up to modern standards? Limited to Maryland. In fact, it's not even limited to the United States. This is a worldwide issue. I just saw in the news this morning that over in Russia they had a dam fail on the last day, and it blocks a pr primary artery for them to the northwest of Moscow. So uh, it, it's a you know, lines that come through, and a lot of these can be impacted if a dam was to fail. But uh, having owners of older dams we, we we have to push them to maintain them their dams and keep them in a safe operating condition and then over time if we see like we push for them to improve that but that's more of a long-term challenge you say you push them to improve it it's not just like hey you should do this and or is it like, hey, do this, or I'm going to give you consequences? So Charlie's team would expect to elevate those consequences. Okay. Like all the way to the OAG. Okay. And then when a dam, when an application comes in for repair, renovation, modification, new construction, then we require it to be brought up to the whole standards. Now, that being said, you know, right? It's think of it like buying houses, like starts in the low of three to four hundreds. Right? I mean, these projects are hundreds of thousands of dollars, about millions of dollars, almost always. So it's very difficult to, even if we drive compliance, even if we raise. Orders. If the money's not there, nothing happens. So. You know, we're working with the client grants and other stuff, which are almost non existent. Also, uh, even require things to be brought up to current standards. Now, that being said, Charlie highlighted on it. Like, current so what's called the probable maximum precipitation, which is what I have for dams and nuclear power plants. Maryland, about 27 to 28 inches of rain in six hours. Uh, it's quite a bit, but recognize that that is based on science and data that's over 50 years old. And the federal government has updated it. So we commissioned independently, sought grant money, and are almost finalized with a modern study incorporating all of the rainfall events, including the PMD level events like Hurricane Harvey, you know, Houston, a few years ago, the East Coast, that brings it. Climate change scenario was not what that PMP would be, which actually, because of how the PMP is derived, it's synthetics, it's the worst of the worst. Climate change projections actually will not change the PMP because you are in maximized the theoretical climatological conditions that you know, So that should be launched later this year. And actually, we'll see values drop for some damn orders, which is what they have to claim for. Yeah, some data will probably see it. So, 
what we can do is talk about strategic enforcement, right? We don't automatically say, you're deficient, standards have changed, you all have to come in and try to get upgraded. But through inspection programs, you kind of find ways to get them in the door with the permit, which then opens the door to get them up to. Okay, uh, if we have time for one more question, and then we are going to wrap this up. We will be available to, to network uh, for up to an hour in this room for those of you who want to stay and ask further questions. Otherwise, I want to remind everybody that uh, Suzanne Dorsey is also out in the courtyard, the courtyard taking questions. <laughs> So I'm week. mine's like specific, so I can also wait. I was just curious. I'm from Hartford County, and so like I would always drive over like the Conowingo Dam. So I was just wondering if that one was like a high risk one because there's like the hydroelectric plant. Like it just seems like there's a lot of things going on there. For one, like I'm just curious about like the risk with that one. Oh, that's definitely a high hazard. Yeah. Yes, okay, that's that. what I thought. Like, it can't import deposits below it and actually yeah. have any grace as well. So, yeah. um, and they also generate power. So, the federal right. government regulates it as well, the federal energy regulation. Okay, that's what I was wondering too. Yeah, like who else regulates it? It can't just be MC. Cause and it's and they're, they're pretty rigorous in their res regulation of it. So, right. Because it does it supplies energy to like how many. I know it's in Philadelphia, I think, is where. At least that's where originally it, used to all go. Oh, wow. I don't know how the power grid works now, but um, wow. yeah, and, and it's like they're constantly doing maintenance on that dam. Oh, okay. but do you, so, but you guys do like partially like regulated? Yes, we're we're a participant. We're not the primary regulator in this case. The federal government is, but we're still an active participant. Oh, cool. Well, thank you everybody for coming. Um, yes. Sorry, we're still no, no, the thanks the more thanks, the better. I, I'd like to thank Charlie for well crafted presentation, good cartoons nonetheless. <laughs> had a lot of time, and hopefully everybody here. Uh, one of the things that he stresses a lot is situational awareness. And hopefully everybody in the room and online has a little bit more situational awareness of what a dam is, maybe what a problem yeah. is. And if you see something, you know, something we say all the time now, if you see something, say something, come come to us. You know, if you got questions, uh, we're up on the fifth floor, not with everybody else. We got we got nice things up on the fifth floor. Uh, again, if you've got questions or you see something that might be a concern, come to us. More eyes out there in the field is going to benefit all of us.